Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St. John, verses 1 to 11. It's the Gospel for the fifth Sunday of Lent. St. John writes, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response they went away one by one beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. That's from the 8th chapter of St. John, verses 1 to 11. And what does that suggest to us? Well, many comments of, about the modern world have been made over several past decades by recent popes. One of them, that has been repeated and developed by his successors, is that by the servant of God, Pope Pius XII. He wrote that the sin of the modern age is the loss of the sense of sin. This issue of the loss of the sense of sin is something that has been discussed by great religious writers over the past few centuries of the modern period. For instance, John Henry Newman, as a young Anglican clergyman during the second decade of the 19th century, commented on it in his sermons, and undoubtedly the issue of the sense of sin had been passed on to him by those who had been an influence on him. Newman went on to give the sense of sin a central place in his philosophy of religion. But now, let us notice a few things which our Lord sense, said about the sense of sin. We remember his story of the prayer of the Pharisee in the temple and the prayer of the publican in the temple at the same time. The Pharisee, in his prayer, listed before God the good things he had been doing and how different he was from the publican who was praying some distance from him in the temple too. The publican, by contrast, could only entrust himself to the mercy of God, saying, Have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. His sense of sin prompted a prayer which our Lord said justified him, whereas the Pharisee went home alienated from God. So, for the sinner, his humble acknowledgement of sin will be the prompt for entrusting himself the mercy of God. In this sense, the consciousness of being a sinner is a foundation for religion. If one has little or no sense of sin, apart from this itself being sinful, as in the case of the Pharisee, one of the foundations for authentic religion will be lacking. Typically, modern man lacks this foundation. But the sense of sin 
not only affects our relationship with God, it also affects our relationship with others. We remember another parable of our Lord in which he describes the master who summoned the servant to repay an astronomical debt, 10,000 talents. The servant was utterly unable to pay, so the king ordered him to be sold with his wife and possessions so that at least some of the debt might be recovered. The servant pleaded with him to give him time, and the master felt so sorry for him that he forgave the entire debt and let his servant go. But what happened then? The servant, without the slightest consciousness of his indebtedness to his master, proceeded to afflict a fellow servant who owed him a substantial debt, but nothing remotely comparable to the debt he himself had been freed from. He lacked, we might say, a sense of personal sin, and this resulted in a lack of forgiveness towards others. This was particularly serious because our Lord ends the parable by saying that our Heavenly Father will deal with us severely if we do not forgive others from the heart. Now then, let us consider our, our gospel event of today. The Pharisees come to our Lord, dragging into his presence a sinner, the woman, and ask our Lord about her condemnation. Our Lord's response? We read that Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. They came to our Lord with little or no sense of personal sin. And as a result, they were very unforgiving. When their sins were brought to their conscience, they retired in shame and confusion. The foundation of authentic religion is humility. Humility involves a recognition of our position before God. We are not only his creatures, utterly dependent on him in every way, but we are also sinners. And so we have even more reason to abase ourselves before him and before others. We have no grounds for pride before God, nor before others. So whenever we observe the sin in others, let us be forgiving, knowing that we too are sinners and have an account to render before God.